There are those who are cursed to dwell on past sins, past atrocities that can never truly be forgiven. Lost in thought, lost in pain, they know only melancholy, tragedy, and the terror at Collinwood. Collinwood, tis I, your old fiend, Penny Dreadful, and I'm very excited to report that Terror at Collinwood has been nominated for a Rondo Hatton Classic Horror Award. That's right, not only Terror at Collinwood, but I myself have been nominated for Favorite Horror Host. Uh, I've won that award twice, which is quite an honor, and several of my friends have also been nominated in that category. I think that was a, a sort of an honorary nomination, I think, because I only did one. Halloween special this past year where I showed Night Tide and uh, a poem of Poe. But, haha, Terror at Collinwood being nominated. My goodness, what a, an unexpected surprise that was. And I'm really thrilled to see that. Um, the Rondo Hatton Classic Horror Awards, for those who don't know, or the Rondo Awards for short, are sort of like the People's Choice Award for classic horror. It's a vote system where people can send their votes in to Terraco at AOL.com, T-A-R-A-C-O at AOL.com. And that's run by David and Eileen Colton. And uh, David is the former front page editor of USA Today. He runs the Classic Horror Film Board and he uh, started the Rondo Awards and they've been going for many years now. And you can vote if you want to vote for Terror at Collinwood. I certainly would be appreciative of that. Please send your votes in by Sunday night at midnight, April 17th, 2022. The full ballot can be found at rondoaward.com, and I'll put a link to it in the show description. There are many other amazing nominations on there. Many of my friends have been nominated in so many categories. I can't possibly name them all because there are so many of them, but I will say that there are seven Dark Shadows specific nominations, and quite a few of the guests who've been on Terror at Collinwood have been nominated. I'm just going to list them off here. Ansel H. Farage was nominated in the Best Short Film category for The Most Haunted House of Venice Beach, which was Christopher Pennock's final film, and in the Best Magazine column for Ansel's Asylum for the Psychotronic in We'd Belong Dead magazine. Ansel and Richard Halpern were nominated for Best Event for A Dark Shadows Christmas Carol. Mary O'Leary was nominated for her film Dark Shadows and Beyond, the Jonathan Frid story in the Best Documentary category. And incidentally, the documentary has been amassing many awards at various independent film festivals, including the Bright International Film Festival, which won for Best Narrative Documentary, winner for Best Editing, Indie Eye Film Awards, winner for Best Documentary Feature, Only the Best International Film Awards, and many more. It's just scooping up awards left and right. And if you haven't seen it yet, good news, you can now watch it for free with ads on Tubi. You can watch it on Tubi, you can watch it on Voodoo Fans, you can watch it on Plex, you can watch it on Redbox, on demand, free with ads. Give it a look. The remarkable Catherine Lee Scott was nominated for her interview Child of Dark Shadows, with David Hennessy in the Best Article category. That was in Fangoria. Wallace McBride's The Collinsport Historical Society was once again nominated for Best Website, which won back in 2012. Patrick McRae's The Dark Shadows Daybook received a nomination for Best Book Nonfiction. Turning the Tide, containing the story Blood of Dracula by Stephen D. Sullivan, was nominated for Best Classic Horror Fiction. Rod Labby was nominated for two Rondo Awards, Storm Clouds Over Collinwood, from the Dark Side number 2019 for Best Article, and the Lara Parker Interview in Retro fan number 17 for best interview alongside terror at collinwood the literary license podcast with co-host tom diamond was also nominated for best podcast and by the way i'd really like to suggest that everyone write in dan curtis for monster kid hall of fame dan curtis was a big fan of classic horror he mentioned in several interviews that he used to love that stuff when he was a kid he used to go watch all of those movies we love dracula frankenstein he was excited that they built a frankenstein set on dark shadows he had that spirit in him of the monster kid spirit and i really think that curtis should be in the monster kid hall of fame it's a write-in category so do us all a favor if you're going to vote in the rondo awards just write in dan curtis because he deserves to be in that 
I'd also like to mention, as I said, so, so many of my friends, not only Dark Shadows related, but ge generally like classic horror related, so many people in there. Uh, Raymond Castile from Raymond Castile's Basement of Horror was nominated for Best Website. So many of my horror host friends were nominated in there. Daniel Horn, Mark Maddox, who painted the Dark Shadows lunchbox, by the way, he is uh, in there. Uh, and I want to get Mark on the show at some point and talk to him. Uh, Ricardo Delgado was nominated for Best Fiction Book for Dracula of Transylvania, also in the best podcast category, Derek M. Cook from Monster Kid Radio, the Classic Horrors Club podcast. I mean, there, there are so many great people on here. I've met many of them over the years at conventions like Monster Bash, Wonderfest, Monster Fest, Horror Hound. Uh, I mean, so many of over the years, I've just gone to so many of these as Penny Dreadful, doing appearances as Penny Dreadful. I've met a lot of great people and I'm thrilled to see them on this ballot. So please do vote in the Rondo Awards rondoaward.com you can send your votes to taraco at aol.com now then on with the show be careful my friend where you tread for i warn you now there are spoilers ahead today i want to talk about the gothic and we talk about the gothic every time we talk about dark shadows and what does that mean what, what does it mean when people say oh dark, dark shadows is gothic what does that what does that even mean? So what I want to do is take a look at the gothic characteristics of Dark Shadows, some of them. This could just go on forever because there's so much that can be said about this when we're examining the gothic as it relates uh, to Dark Shadows. So I want to take a look at some of this. You know, even though Dan Curtis, who as I said was a fan of gothic films and ghost stories, originally wanted to do Dark Shadows as a nighttime series, the fact that it was made under the the daytime serial or soap opera banner worked out quite well because the serial structure of the show provides the best and most authentic possible vehicle for Curtis and the writers to incorporate many of the archetypal traits of gothic horror and gothic romance into the show. Now, when we're talking about fans, you know, I might mention the way fans talk about Dark Shadows or the way fans look at Dark Shadows. Look, we all bring our own perceptions, experiences, and interests to the table. Everybody has the right to enjoy the show in their own way. If you feel that Dark Shadows is um, campy uh, and it makes you laugh... And I, believe me, I've laughed many times uh, from watching Dark Shadows, uh, uh, not at it, but lovingly, lo uh, you know, I mean, how can you not laugh, you know, when the bell falls off the door at the antique shop in between Jeb and uh, Sheriff Davenport, and they just kind of look down and continue the scene. I mean, it's funny, you, but you empathize with the actors in that situation, but it's also something that would naturally happen, you know, sometimes these things happen. The, the world does not function perfectly according to our whims. If we, if we open a door, sometimes... The bell's going to fall off the door, for real. I hear people say, well, bloopers, you know, it's just, I can justify bloopers left and right. I love doing that. It's using your imagination to fill in the blanks. It's like a game to me. I love that stuff. And of course, I realize the characters aren't real. Of course, I realize they're actors in a show. But... I like imagining the blanks, what takes place in those blank spaces that the writers didn't fill in, because it's fun for me to justify those things. When Dr. Lang refers to Dr. Woodard because Jonathan Frid forgot his line, right? When Addison Powell feeds him Dave Woodard, that's not because Addison Powell is feeding Jonathan Frid a line on camera. That's because story-wise, Dr. Lang knows what happened with Dave Woodard, you see, because Dave Woodard and Eric Lang are both physicians who work in a small town in Collinsport. They probably knew each other. Maybe Dave Woodard mentioned something to, to Dr. Lang. Maybe that stayed in his head. So then when he met Barnabas, perhaps off screen, that conversation came up. That conversation could very well have happened with regard to Dave Woodard. And maybe Barnabas admitted to it. I mean, they were buddies at that point, uh, and they were in cahoots to, to, to do what they were doing. So when he mentioned Dave Woodard, he was in on it at that point. He knew he had known who he was before he died and probably put two and two together and confronted Barnabas about it. And Barnabas told him and admitted to it and implicated Julia as well. And thus he knows about it. You know, this is what I mean. Like you can have fun with that kind of stuff. Spackling, as uh, Kathy Rush pointed out, is the fandom term for that. But anyway, I'm getting off topic here. When we're talking about fans, everybody has the right, to, of course, to enjoy the show the, the way they want to. I try to put myself in other people's shoes and how they see the show and what their perception of the show is. And while I may not always agree with their point of view, 
if they're a fan of the show and they're expressing their enthusiasm for it in their own way, I'm on board for that. More power to you. But I think to truly understand Dark Shadows, it's important to look at it within the context, the larger context of the Gothic and especially the serialized Gothic. Dark Shadows reflects those characteristics intrinsic to Gothic horror and Gothic romance, which either grew out of or are closely related to the literary movement known as Romanticism. There's some debate about this, according to Robert Hume in Gothic versus Romantic, that Gothicism is closely related to Romanticism is perfectly clear, but it is easier to state the fact than to prove it tidily and convincingly. There is a persistent suspicion that Gothicism is a poor and probably illegitimate relation of Romanticism and a consequent tendency to treat it that way. There are those, indeed, who would like to deny the relationship altogether. And the following comes from UMass Lowell, page was created by Bridget Marshall, for the Gothic tradition in literature. Romanticism is sometimes characterized as the larger movement of which the Gothic is a part, a subset or variety. Other scholars see them as quite distinct, or even see the Gothic as the precursor that leads to the rise of Romanticism. Romanticism is probably the larger category in terms of number of authors and texts, and is certainly privileged by critics as the genre with greater aesthetic value. Gothic is often seen as the more popular genre. Okay, so the Gothic genre, and I'm talking about both Gothic romance and Gothic horror. This is a massive topic to tackle here, so I'm only going to hit on some of the big things. I don't want to bore everyone to tears, but I really want to talk about this, and I know people have asked me to kind of address it, so we're going to do this. I used a lot of reference works for this. These are books I've had for a while and websites and things like that. Just throwing some off here that I've used. Uh, I encourage you to seek these out because if you're a fan of Dark Shadows, understanding the Gothic as a whole helps to put Dark Shadows in its proper context. So here are the reference works I used. I'm going to be referring to these as I talk. I'm going to read you excerpts as I go along. Um, When I hit on some of these characteristics, I'm just going to open these books or websites. The Encyclopedia of Gothic Literature by Mary Ellen Snodgrass, the Encyclopedia of the Gothic, edited by William Hughes, David Punter, and Andrew Smith, the Cambridge Companion to Gothic Fiction, edited by Gerald E. Hogel, and Horror and Fantasy Study Guide, second edition by the late great Professor Mike Hurley, who, when I was a grad student, I was doing a directed study with Professor Michael Boyd that I, I came up with the topic for, which was uh, otherness in Gothic horror films. And I wrote a lengthy research paper on that. Um, it took the whole semester to write that paper, but it was a cool directed study. But Michael Boyd at the time said, oh, you should talk to Mike Hurley. He is big into that stuff. So I went to his office and, uh, you know, he was an older gentleman with a ponytail. He was just a leather jacket, just the coolest guy. But he was a horror writer. He used to write uh, fantasy and horror stories and dark fairy tales, all kinds of great stuff. He was quite the enthusiast when it came to gothic horror. And he handed me a bunch of books, including this study guide, which I, I've held on to for quite a few years now. And he, he passed away not too long ago, and he is certainly missed. Uh, Anyway, I'm glad to have this and several other of his books. So I also looked at assorted websites like Robert Harris's Elements of the Gothic Novel and the Glossary of the Gothic at Marquette University, Crimson Cass, the Toledo Library, and Wikipedia. So there are lots of different sources that I'm going to be pulling from. I'm just going to be flipping through these books and websites and reading directly from them. Okay, so the first thing I want to look at, horror versus terror. Uh, I've said before that Dark Shadows is more terror than horror. Dark Shadows is a terror show. You could call it dark fantasy or gothic fantasy. Uh, Sometimes you see it used because it's a way of describing classic gothic horror without using the horror label because the word horror has a lot of baggage attached to it is what it is. The name of the genre is gothic horror, at least insofar as what I'm talking about in this episode, even though it probably should be gothic terror, really, but it's it's gothic horror is the name of the, this genre. There is horror as well in gothic horror. I'm not saying it's entirely terror. There has to be horror in it. The payoff is usually horror. Uh, so gothic horror is not entirely inaccurate. It's just, if you look at a scale, it's the weight of the scale is more on the terror side than the horror side, but there's still some weight on the horror side too. It's just that horror is just used as an umbrella term for the genre as a whole. But if you look at film, right, and you take films like Hostel, The Wolfman, the classic Wolfman, Friday the 13th, Nosferatu, Human Centipede, Evil of Frankenstein, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and The Innocents, 
I've mentioned several films there, they're all categorized as horror, when in fact many of them feature the use of terror more so than horror. So the lines are blurred there because the tone of each of those films is very, very different. So, I mean, I can see why it can get confusing and why people don't want to attach the horror label. Dan Curtis himself resisted the horror label for Dark Shadows and for much of his work. He did not like using that. Boris Karloff did not like referring to his films as horror films. He called them terror films. So let's look at well-known Gothic writer Anne Radcliffe's classic definition of horror versus terror from On the Supernatural in Poetry. Radcliffe says that terror expands the soul and awakens the faculties to a high degree of life. Horror, in contrast, freezes and nearly annihilates them with its unambiguous displays of atrocity. And then she goes on to say, obscurity leaves something for the imagination to exaggerate. Confusion, by blurring one image into another, leaves only chaos, which the mind can find nothing to be magnificent, nothing to nourish its fears or doubts, or to act upon in any way. And then I pulled this from the Master's Review blog. Terror is the feeling of dread and apprehension at the possibility of something frightening, while horror is the shock and repulsion of seeing the frightening thing. Terror is the sounds of unknown creatures scratching at the door. Horror is seeing your roommate eaten alive by giant rats. Terror is the feeling a stranger may be hiding behind the door. Horror is the squirt of blood as the stranger knife sinks in. Terror in its ambiguity moves us toward yet another effect, the sublime. The sublime is the confused awe at greatness and darkness our mind can't grasp. We are both attracted to and repelled by it. Okay, are you still with me? You're probably not with me. Come back, come back to me. All right, as it applies to dark shadows, there is horror in dark shadows. Make no mistake. I'm not saying Dark Shadows is devoid of horror. There is horror in Dark Shadows. The werewolf mangling Mr. Wells, the innkeeper, is horror. Barnabas sinking his supernatural fangs into your throat to suck your blood is horror. Dead Josette lifting her veil to show you her disfigured face is horror. But those tend to be the kind of the final moments of shock that are built up to through the use of terror and suspense. But then you get the final reveal, which is horror, and it often is the end of the episode. When Jeff Clark brings that box to Dr. Lang and he opens it and it's a severed human arm. That's horror. This is a severed human arm. That's repugnant. But what about terror? Which is what Dark Shadows trades in more so than in horror. David and Amy late at night exploring the cobwebbed, shadowy west wing of Collinwood. They find a disconnected old 19th century phone. Amy picks it up and puts it to her ear. And although we can't hear what's on the other end, Amy can. She hears a voice. Then David takes the disconnected telephone and listens, and hears someone hang up. The seance. The beckoner is calling to the spirit, entreating them to make their presence known. The candle begins to flicker. A gust of wind blows through the room, and the chandelier starts swaying. One of the participants begins to moan. And then suddenly, the candles go out and boom, the doors blow open. Or how about poor Maggie Evans, tossing and turning in her bed late into the night. And outside, in the gloom and in the darkness, we hear... Oh yeah. We know what that means. The dogs are disturbed by an unnatural presence. We don't need to see Fangs. We don't even need to see his silhouette at the window. We know Barnabas is out there. We know he craves blood. These are the kinds of things that get our imaginations going, that give us goosebumps. That, my friends, is terror. All right. Are you still with me? I hope you're still with me. Okay. Let's take a look at some of the characteristics 
of the Gothic. This I pulled from Wikipedia. Gothic fiction is characterized by an environment of fear, the threat of supernatural events, and the intrusion of the past upon the present. Gothic fiction is distinguished from other forms of scary or supernatural stories, such as fairy tales, by the specific theme of the present being haunted by the past. The setting typically includes physical reminders of the past, especially through ruined buildings, which stand as proof of a previously thriving world which is decaying in the present. Especially in the 18th and 19th centuries, characteristic settings include castles, monasteries and convents and crypts. So in the case of Dark Shadows, Collinwood serves as the castle. Then you have crumbling buildings from the past, like the old house. You also get crypts, of course, with the, the Collins family mausoleum, the Eagle Hill Cemetery, etc. There are many, many, many characteristics intrinsic to Gothic literature. Some of these evolved and mutated as the genre continued from the 18th and into the 19th and 20th and 21st centuries. For example, the ominous old castles of 18th century Gothic literature became the ominous old mansions of 19th century Gothic literature and ghost stories. The dark fog shrouded uh, moors and forests became the dark fog shrouded Victorian streets of London, for example. So Gothic literature is characterized by an atmosphere of mystery, suspense, and fear, which is usually heightened by elements of the unknown or unexplained. Gothic works are pervaded by a threatening feeling, a fear enhanced by the unknown. Often the plot itself is built around a mystery such as unknown parentage, a disappearance, or some other inexplicable event. So when you see an article that states, Dark Shadows started as a more or less standard soap opera, that's not true. You don't say. That is incorrect. Well, gee whiz, I've never watched an episode in my life. Dark Shadows, from the outset, was built around mystery unknown parentage, a sense of dread, a disappearance, and other inexplicable events, okay? This was already happening right off the bat. No pun intended, the bat came later. Uh, but it, no, it is definitely immediately gothic. It's, it's a, started as a gothic romance. It was never a standard soap opera. Dark Shadows was unique for many other reasons as well. There was Bob Colbert's orchestral music. There were the beautiful Cy Tomashoff gothic sets. Joan Bennett movie star, interesting camera angles and shots. It was like nothing else on TV at that time. Okay, atmosphere of mystery and suspense. Isolation. Isolation is a common element of Gothic fiction, and the setting is no exception. Often, Gothic tales take place a long way from civilization, where the protagonist is trapped inside the castle, the house, the mansion, etc., and cannot easily get away. Think about Collinwood. Think about Collinsport itself. Okay, yeah, it's not far from Bangor, relatively not far from Boston, but still there's an element of isolation to Collinsport, and particularly the Collins estate high up on Widow's Hill. And the fact that Dark Shadows consciously avoids mentioning current events or making pop culture references all ties in to this sense of isolation. It exists in this other world almost. It is part of the real world, but it's also not. Okay, next up. Omens, portents, visions. A character may have a disturbing dream, vision, or some phenomenon that may be seen as a portent of coming events. I mean, need I say more? How often does this kind of thing happen in dark shadows? Constantly. Okay, my dreary one, let's take a look at the next gothic characteristic. <laughs> Heightened or even overwrought emotion. The narration may be highly sentimental and the characters are often overcome by anger, sorrow, surprise, and especially terror. Characters suffer from raw nerves and a feeling of impending doom. Crying and emotional speeches are frequent. Breathlessness and panic are common. In the filmed gothic, screaming is common. This is often why I think people point to Dark Shadows and say, that's campy. Incorrect. Dark Shadows is accurately reflecting a key characteristic of the Gothic. It drives me up a wall when people say Dark Shadows is tongue-in-cheek. Despite the fact that every major player involved with the show has denied that that's the case, including Grayson Hall, who I think is the one people point to the most when they're pointing to, oh, campy. She's overplaying it intentionally because that's what the genre calls for. And that's what Leela Swift and what the directors were calling for as well. Because she did... You 
you know, in some of her reactions, especially if she was crying or scared or something like that, she would play it big. Usually, though, most of the time, Julia was cool as a cucumber, um, but Grayson was larger than life as a person, and that came across in her performance as well. But I don't think she was making fun of the subject matter by any means, and certainly not Jonathan Frid either. But those big reactions are part and parcel. Those screams and <gasps> gasps and all of this kind of stuff, it, that's part of the gothic tradition, which maybe by today's standards is considered campy. I've heard people say that about classic horror films too. I disagree because it's incorrect. I think the only one that I'm aware of that claimed there was some tongue-in-cheek happening in Dark Shadows is Michael Stroka. He did say that in one of his interviews, but he is the only one that I'm aware of who made a comment to that effect. And given the fact that most of the actors and the writers and Dan Curtis deny that vehemently, although they admit to always laughing about the subject matter when they weren't filming, at least as far as some of the actors are concerned. And I can see that being funny. Some of the crazy stuff they did, absolutely. You know, but when the cameras went on, they played it straight. So it's possible that Michael Stroka was remembering that aspect of it. Um, I think Michael was off the mark with saying that. But anyway, heightened emotion, heightened emotion. We see this a lot in Dark Shadows. Through the highly sentimental languages or instances of the panic, the terror, feelings characters experience expressed in a way that could be seen as overblown and exaggerated in order to make them seem out of control and at the mercy of the increasingly malevolent influences that surround them. If you look at a Hammer film, if you look at a Universal horror film, if you look at a Poe Corman film, uh, not The Raven. The Raven is a comedy. The Raven is a is a horror comedy. But I'm talking more about things like Pit and the Pendulum or, or the House of Follow the House of Usher. Those are gothic. They feature heightened emotion. Not as a way to poke fun at the genre or the subject matter, which you could say the Raven perhaps does lovingly. I, I'm not saying that it's mocking the genre, but lovingly so. But uh, certainly not something like the Tomb of Lygia or the Mask of the Red Death or looking to, to other films, the Mexican gothics like El Vampiro or the, the Mario Bava gothics like Black Sunday or Black Sabbath or Kill Baby Kill. These are not campy films. These all feature the same type of heightened emotion, heightened sentimentality, etc. that we see in Dark Shadows as well. Okay, I spent way too much time talking about that characteristic, but uh, it's something I brought up, I think, in the first episode of this podcast, and I've been meaning to talk about it ever since. So let's talk about the setting when it comes to the gothic genre. The setting, I talked a little bit about this with the setting of the gothic novel, can be considered a character in its own right. Many of the stories are set in a castle or a large moor, which is typically abandoned or run down, far removed from civilization. Other settings could include wilderness locales, which think about Collinwood is isolated, surrounded by forest. We talked, I, I'm kind of repeating myself with this. Okay, up next, women in distress. It is a dated trope, but it's a regular feature of the gothic genre, and we definitely see it in Dark Shadows. Uh, the damsel in distress, uh, heroines typically tend to be orphaned, abandoned, or somehow severed from the world without guardianship. It's an appeal to the sympathy of the reader. The female characters often face events that leave them fainting, terrified, screaming, and or sobbing. A lonely, pensive, and oppressed heroine is often the central figure of a gothic novel, so her sufferings are even more pronounced in the focus of attention. The damsel in distress is often threatened by a powerful, impulsive, or tyrannical male character. There are exceptions to this, however. For example, Sheridan Lifanu's Carmilla, who is a, a vampire. And we could get into this whole other conversation about gothic horror character archetypes. Like you could argue that Angelique is in that territory when we're talking about characters like Carmilla, or if we're looking at uh, Princess Asa in Black Sunday, there are problematic aspects to this, which falls under the category of othering, which you may have heard of othering a group of people. Uh, we'll talk about otherness when we get to that. But that said, gothic horror and gothic romance archetypes can be found throughout the run of Dark Shadows. Quite a few of them. Maybe I'll do a separate episode on breaking down the different archetypes of the gothic genre. Melancholy. Uh, melancholy. The emotions of sad longing and regret tinge much of gothic and romantic literature, particularly the willful moodiness of the graveyard poets who chose shadows 
shadowed cemeteries and doleful grieving as their focus. During the initial wave of English Gothicism, novelist Anne Radcliffe described sad thoughts as a normal reaction to loss. At the height of Victorian Gothicism, Charlotte Bronte followed the Radcliffian example in picturing melancholy as a normal psychological response to loss. The deliberate creation of sad scenes infused mid to late 19th century literature, coloring Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven, Christina Rossetti's wistful contemplation of death in song, and Nathaniel Hawthorne's gothic tales and novels. With regard to Dark Shadows, there's so much melancholy brooding, standing on Widow's Hill, looking out at the turbulent ocean and contemplating those who died there before, the troubled past, Elizabeth looking out onto the ocean, thinking she killed Paul Stardard. Quentin sitting alone in his room as his gramophone plays that haunting melody, and he drinks brandy and contemplates his troubled life. Barnabas is all about the melancholy, you know, the wistful, sad longing for what he has lost. Next up, dare you contemplate the motif of confinement. Confinement, particularly of an innocent female character, is a major motif in Gothic lore. It derives in part from folklore, the Greek myth of Persephone's imprisonment in the underworld, the Grimm Brothers fairy tale of Rapunzel in the tower, and the wife and master tale Peter Peter Pumpkin Eater, an undated nursery rhyme. After the formation of Gothic conventions in the late 18th century, authors used cells to accentuate claustrophobia, mental torment, and terror. These settings typically produced a living death in some forgotten cell. So think about Barnabas imprisoning Maggie Evans. There are so many instances in Dark Shadows of this happening, especially Vicky and Maggie. See uh, Damsel in Distress uh, that I mentioned earlier. This is a recurring thing in Dark Shadows, but confinement. Vicky, before even Barnabas was in the show, you know, she was locked in the room by David, then she was locked in the secret room by Matthew Morgan. This continues through the series. You see this pretty much continuously. I mean, let's go to parallel time. Julia gets locked in the basement by parallel time. Angelique or parallel time Maggie gets locked up in the shack by uh, John Yeager. But it's not only the female characters, actually. There's plenty of instances where the male characters also get locked up in the dungeons or cells of some sort. Uh, Quentin getting locked up by Trask to see if he'll turn into a werewolf during the full moon. Barnabas also, when he was robbed of his powers by Count Patofi, was locked up by Edward. So we see this happening also to male characters in the show, but often it's the ingenue character, Vicky or Maggie primarily, that this happens to quite often in Dark Shadows. Um, witchcraft, the occult, necromancy. My favorite pastimes or something you see quite often on Dark Shadows or both. I'll let you decide. I don't think I need to elaborate on this one. I think it kind of speaks for itself. Lots of that going on in Dark Shadows in various permutations. Another major Gothic characteristic is obsession. So obsession uh, in the Gothic as a motivator of the Gothic novel and short fiction, obsession becomes a controlling form of aberrant behavior in characters. Obsession ventures beyond romantic attachments to a number of engulfing thoughts and impulses. Think about um, mad scientist Victor Frankenstein's drive to succeed in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Think about uh, Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart, the, the narrator's sick obsession and hate with uh, the old man's eye. And of course, there's plenty of obsession in Dark Shadows. The prime example that comes to mind, as always, is Barnabas with Josette and his fixation on Josette, his obsession with bringing Josette back, his obsession with bringing the past into the present, which is another gothic motif. Then we have Angelique, who is obsessed with Barnabas. Then we have Dr. Lang, who's obsessed with his experiment, and Adam himself, who is obsessed. Count Petofi is obsessed with going to the future once he finds out Barnabas is from the future. Charles Delaware Tate is obsessed with this image of Amanda Harris, this woman that he created. Burke Devlin is obsessed with getting revenge on the Collins family. Elizabeth becomes obsessed with death and with being buried alive, which is straight out of Edgar Allan Poe. But then we also have insanity as a gothic trope. Insanity is a pivotal theme in gothic literature, in part as a retreat of the mind from sensational or macabre events and apparitions that overthrow 
thorough reason think about Joe Haskell. Poor Joe Haskell. After all he went through, he ended up in Wincliffe, the mental hospital, the asylum of dark shadows. He snaps. He loses his mind. A uh, parallel time, Gabriel, after spending the night in the room, Jenny, poor crazy Jenny. I, she's probably the most memorable insane character. What about Matthew Morgan when he finally starts to slip and lose it? The identification of characters as unstable or psychotic creates an otherness that elicits pity and compassion and elevates the humanity of the social situation. Alrighty then, I've mentioned otherness several times in this podcast, so let's look at that characteristic of the gothic genre. <sighs> otherness. And this comes from the, the Gothic Network online. I'm pulling from so many sources that haphazardly. I have picture me, I am surrounded in books. I have all these tabs open and I am just having a complete blast pulling from all of these things as I read them too. Otherness is a social construct often used in Gothic literature that represents how one group often views another. It's possibly a threatening outside group. The other is an individual who is perceived by the in-group as not belonging, as being different in some fundamental way, any stranger or threat threat to the in-group can become the other. Many people view supernatural occurrences or beings as extreme examples of the other because of the immense threat that they can pose to humanity. Now, of course, when we other people in real life, that is wrong and super problematic. And un unfortunately, humans have done that for millennia. But when we're talking about gothic fiction, this is often depicted through the use of the supernatural, the undead the werewolf, the ghost, etc. That said, gothic fiction is not devoid of the otherness we see in real life, sadly, where certain groups of people are maligned or presented in less than flattering ways or in stereotypical ways, in ways that are certainly problematic, for sure. There is othering of cultures, races, genders, sexualities, etc. Unfortunately. See H.P. Lovecraft. I love his stories, but wow. Yeah. Duh. Yikes. But let's just say his views on race were problematic even by the standards of his time, and that's understating it. That's all I have to say. So, the purpose of this podcast is not to look at metaphor and gothic fiction and how it applies to real life othering. I'm looking at monsters and the monsters in gothic fiction, uh, they are metaphors for many different things. Look it up. Hint, sex is a big one. And, and interestingly, Dark Shadows, as we talk, when we talk about subverting the gothic, the other becomes, it, it's reversed. Like the, the outsiders are those who dare not discover the secrets of those who are the other, at least as far as some of the characters go, you know, then they are a thread. Uh, but in gothic fiction, you know, you have Dracula, Mr. Hyde, the Frankenstein monster, Peter Quint and Miss Jessel in Turn of the Screw. And uh, this ties in also with monsters and with the monstrous, those who behave monstrously or disfigurement, uh, those with evil impulses who act on them, insane killers and those who dabble in the occult. These all represent a form of otherness. And sometimes they're supernatural monsters or sometimes they just are monstrous. All right, let's talk about cereals. Are you cereal? In the 19th century, serial publications boosted readership of magazines and journals. Magazine publishing was a highly competitive business in the British Isles, Europe, and North America. To maintain interest in their periodicals, publishers sought gothic horror fiction, Newgate novels, crime and detective stories, sensational tales, and the more decadent gothic fiction to issue in installments or excerpts. For example, in England, Elizabeth Gaskell serialized a gothic novella, The Grey Woman, to increase readers' interest, authors tended to end each segment with a cliffhanger. Sound familiar? There were serialized ghost novels, stories of the occult. Some writers submitted complete works for the publisher to break into segments. Others composed in a month-by-month -month or week-by-week -week works schedule. Examples of serialized gothic fiction cover the gamut of Victorian and Edwardian popular prose. And there were a lot of these stories that were serialized, just like Dark Shadows, and ended with cliffhangers. More 19th century examples. The Shilling Shockers, The Penny Dreadfuls, these were ser serialized. The Gothic Blue Books, The Shilling Shockers, a controversial element of gothic fiction, particularly during the Victorian era, was the blue book or chapbook, a low-cost, quasi-literary miscellany characterized by poor quality paper, gaudy illustrations,
illustrations and printing on portos stitched down the center. It capitalized on Gothic sensationalism and artistic decadence, both in literary style and layout. So for those who say Dark Shadows was a low-budget show, which it wasn't actually by daytime TV standards, it was an expensive show to produce, but... Relatively speaking, I suppose so. And that tradition existed as well with serialized gothic storytelling with the cheaply produced Penny Dreadfuls. Each pamphlet featured dismaying, horrific, and romantic texts illustrated by amateurish woodcuts, for example, images of vampires and werewolves and sketches of witches and demons. These low-level gothic thrillers also interspersed accounts of sensational crimes and beheadings, tall tales, crude farce, vice and wicked deeds, vulgar jests, and exaggerated biographies of royalty. Here we see many serialized tales of terror, such as Varney the Vampire or the Feast of Blood, which, by the way, is the first depiction of a sympathetic vampire. Wagner the Werewolf, A String of Pearls, which is the story of Sweeney Todd. Blue books were known by the street names Penny Bloods, Penny Dreadfuls, and Shilling Shockers. The more enterprising variety of Blue Book hooked its audience with serials that ended with cliffhangers to keep buyers coming back for more. As a result of their popularity, publishers began allotting space to gothic fiction in popular magazines. Sweeney Todd, The Demon Barber of Fleet Street, spooled out with an episodic plot issued at regular intervals in the People's Periodical and Family Library. There was a mania for this stuff in the 19th century. So this predates Dark Shadows by a long time, but Dark Shadows falls right into that serialized tradition. The fact that Dark Shadows was a daily serial worked out really well. Uh, and Dan Curtis wanted this to be a nighttime show. So the fact that it ended up being a soap opera, despite the fact that Dan Curtis wanted it to be a primetime show, actually worked out quite well because Dark Shadows ended up falling into the serialized gothic tradition. The fates sort of aligned to make it happen this way. This structure that already existed on TV allowed for this five-year gothic serialized tale to unfold on daytime television. That is just remarkable that that happened. And now let's talk about the supernatural. The supernatural, a pervasive aspect of folklore and traditional narrative, the supernatural may vary from kindly spirits and an eerie atmosphere to ghouls and ghosts, apparitions, poltergeists, witches, spooks, preternatural powers and demonstrations of sorcery as found in the fearful demons that flash their fangs in Charles Pigault Lebron's The Unholy Compact of Jord. Supranormal entities have permeated most of world literature, particularly the Gothic canon. For example, Horace Walpole's The Castle of Ontranto, Samuel Taylor Coleridge's Vampire Narrative, Christabel, and oh my gosh, so many more. I don't think I need to elaborate on this. We know that Dark Shadows features many instances of the supernatural. We know that gothic literature, gothic film, etc. features many instances of the supernatural. So I think we can move on from this one. It's pretty self-explanatory. So we talked about uh, the distressed heroine in gothic literature. There's also the Byronic hero named after the romantic poet Lord Byron. The Byronic hero is what led to the creation of the anti-hero. There are aspects of the Byronic hero that aren't positive, yet the characters are written in such a way as to make it impossible to hate them, even after they do something horrendous. Some qualities of the Byronic hero include violent temper, seductive nature, cynical, sinister secret or desire, prideful, moody, and revengeful. On the flip side, they are often capable of deep, strong affection, have a tortured soul crying out for compassion, and are viewed as solitary, suffering beings wanting love. Uh, Barnabas much? There's also the love triangle aspect especially gothic romance. Uh, look at Wuthering Heights. Often, there is another character complicating the situation, forming a love triangle with the heroine and hero. The secondary love interest can be for the heroine, often seen as a kind gentleman she has known since childhood, or for the hero, often seen as a sinister seductress. Uh, Josette Barnabas, Angelique Triangle, anyone? Here's yet another trope that's sure to be familiar. The weather is always awful. Thunderstorms, flashes of lightning, accompany revelation, and thunder and downpours usually prefigure the appearance of a character or the beginning of a significant event. The storms and wind signify how the characters are at the mercy of forces they cannot control. The weather can also mirror the character's moods. The fog can descend when a character is confused or depressed. 
thunderstorms are a staple. Every other day, there's a there's a thunderstorm in Collinsport. Um, the metonymy of gloom and horror. Metonymy is a subtype of metaphor in which something like rain is used to stand for something else, like sorrow. For example, the film industry likes to use metonymy as a quick shorthand, so we often notice that it's raining in funeral scenes. Here are some uh, metonymies for doom and gloom that all suggest some element of mystery, danger, or the supernatural. Wind, especially especially howling, rain, especially blowing, doors grating on rusty hinges, sighs, moans, howls, eerie sounds, clanking chains, footsteps approaching, lights in abandoned rooms, gusts of wind blowing out lights, doors suddenly slamming shut, characters trapped in a room, ruins of buildings, thunder and lightning, baying of distant dogs or wolves, crazed laughter, and I think we can check all of those boxes as far as Colin Wood and Colin Sport are concerned. If if you're listening to this show and you've watched 10 episodes of Dark Shadows, you've probably encountered at least half of those things I just mentioned. The double. A doppelganger. The double or doppelganger. A mirroring or duality of a character's persona. The concept of the doppelganger refers to the twin, shadow double, demon double, and split personality, all common characterizations in world folklore. In gothic literature, probably the most famous example is Robert Louis Stevenson, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which which of course appeared in Dark Shadows with Cyrus Longworth and John Yeager, but also with Alexis and Angelique in parallel time. You have the mirroring, the doubling, they are identical, and one is the dark reflection of the other. And they literally used doppelgangers in Dark Shadows as a, as a paranormal manifestation or creature conjured by Angelique or summoned by Angelique in 1897 with the doppelganger of Barnabas, and she made a doppelganger of herself as well. But those were not really characters, like they didn't do much other than to serve a purpose in the plot. I'm looking at like the dark mirror reflection, the evil double. The doppelganger motif typically depicts a double who is both duplicate and antithesis of the original. And there are many more gothic tropes that I could throw out there that we can see in Dark Shadows. Uh, dissipation, evil clergy, shape-shifting, uh, possession. And, and several of these characteristics can be found in other types of fiction that even predate gothic horror and gothic romance. Like if you look at Shakespeare, yes, there are ghosts and thunderstorms that represent turmoil and, and this sort of thing. But when used in combination, and particularly uh, the idea of the past invading the present combined with all of this shrouded mystery and the supernatural and the trapped heroine and cobwebbed shadowy corridors and you start to get this image that forms this mood this tone this style this genre Gothic literature has been around since 1764. Uh, it generally regarded as the first Gothic novel, Horace Walpole's The Castle of Otranto. But right from the outset, those early Gothic novels established a lot of those characteristics, and then those were built upon and transformed in various ways. But, aha, here's a thing, a thing among many things, but an important thing that Dark Shadows did that is really groundbreaking. Um, and I think we can thank uh, the 1960s counterculture for this because I think that informed what happened in Dark Shadows. You see, Dark Shadows took the monsters, the otherness of Gothic fiction, which was an invasive force that must be quelled or destroyed in those stories, and instead turn those characters into the show's leads. The monsters now had goals and depth and feelings. The villains and the creatures of the supernatural were not simply the other. They were more than that. They were complex characters that evolved and changed over the course of the show. Even Jeb Hawks, the bratty elder god, falls in love with Carolyn for real and wants to be human. Even Nicholas Blair fell in love. Well, uh, I mean, I guess it's debatable what love means to Nicholas Blair, but that's a whole other topic. And some of the supernatural characters and their allies became our protagonists and the ones we want to watch lead the charge in ongoing storylines, which is exactly what happened in Dark Shadows. Well, Barnabas, Quentin, Julia, even Angelique, eventually, they became the central focus of the show. The human characters became the victims. I mean, in a way, it's sad. The monsters came in and took over the show, but it worked. That was crazy. That's never been done before. They were gonna stake Barnabas originally. They were gonna drive a stake through his heart, but because 
Jonathan Frid and the writers and Dan Kurt, everybody infused a Barnabas with certain traits. The audience sympathized with the character to some degree, even though he did horrible stuff. And all of those characters did awful things. Quentin, Angelique, and Julia too. She doesn't have to be a supernatural character, although she does fall into the somewhat into the mad scientist category, if you think about it. I mean, Julia is a variation, on, I guess, on Dr. Edelman from House of Dracula, but she falls in love with the vampire. So these characters who at one time would be the monster who must be defeated or who we pity but must die in the end, like the Frankenstein monster. The Frankenstein monster, we pity him, but he becomes... He becomes a figure of darkness because of the way others treat him. By the end of the novel, he's done some pretty bad stuff. Anyway, I'm veering off again, so I'm gonna bring it right on back. Now, on Dark Shadows, the monsters are the protagonists. They're still monsters. It, this is the crazy thing. They still kill people. Barnabas is trying to save the family, but at the same time, he's feeding on people against their wills. Barnabas has a substantial body count throughout the series, but he becomes the show's protagonist. And we start rooting for him and rooting against those who may discover his secret. Now they're on the outside. Those who were once the protagonists of the Gothic novel are now the outsiders who shouldn't discover the secret. We're rooting for Barnabas now. We're rooting for Quentin. We're rooting for Julia. Eventually, we're rooting for Angelique, too. And hey, we're rooting for Professor Stokes, too. But he can't get too close to that secret because Professor Stokes probably wouldn't be cool with that. But he's pretty cool. And he knows how to defeat supernatural threats. So you have Dracula teaming up with Van Helsing, which is kind of wild. Anyway, this idea of the monstrous character, the supernatural character, the other becoming the lead characters in the show and the ones who you follow is now pretty commonplace with genre storytelling. And Dark Shadows did it first. And I think it's pretty clear that... I mean, in an ongoing dramatic series, I'm not talking about the monsters. Clearly, they're supernatural <laughs> characters, but it, it is a completely a comedy, a sitcom, a slapstick sitcom, no less. Things like True Blood, Being Human, Angel, and, and other shows like that. Uh, Dark Shadows created the mold as far as that goes, making it the grandparent of all of those programs and, and many more. So I have talked a lot. If you're still with me at this point, you are a champ. You win the silver fill agree pen. Thank you for, for listening to all that. I really wanted to get that out there. I hope it wasn't too incredibly boring. I promise I'll be back to regular episodes soon enough. I have some great guests lined up, some of whom have been waiting almost a year to be on the show, and I will get them on here eventually. I apologize for delays in that regard, but I have lots of great guests lined up. But I just wanted to really do this episode. I've had a couple of people have asked me about it, and I, I wanted to put Dark Shadows into its proper context in terms of the history of the gods. Gothic. Not only Dark Shadows, but all of these things, all of these gothic films and novels and tales. But anyway, thank you for listening. Please do like and subscribe uh, to the podcast. Please review the podcast. Please do vote in the Rondo Awards, rondoaward.com. And if you feel so inclined, I would appreciate the vote for Tara at Collinwood for best podcast and or for Penny Dreadful for favorite horror host. Send your votes to taraco at aol.com, T-A-R-A-C-O at aol.com. I hope you enjoyed or at least tolerated my extremely nerdy, frenzied lecture on gothic literature and how it applies to Dark Shadows. And thank you very much for listening. And for as long as they lived, the Dark Shadows never truly dissipated, for there will always be terror at Collinwood. Terror at Collinwood is a Penny Dreadful production. I did use two of Robert Colbert's music cues, uh, which I wanted to use to just briefly illustrate horror and terror. Just a quick copyright disclaimer. Under Section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976, allowances made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, commenting, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. This was done for educational purpose and no copyright infringement is intended. I didn't mean no disrespect.